Hi, this is Stephen Wilson, and you're listening to La Grossa Radio. Enjoy. Um, I wouldn't say it was as simple as that. I mean, you know, I've never... I'm sure people might have heard me say this before, and they might not have believed it, but I never thought of myself as a generic kind of musician. I never thought of myself as a progressive rock musician. I thought of myself as a musician, you know, and a songwriter. And those of the those of people that know, you know, my history will know that I grew up in a house where um, I would hear Dark Side of the Moon and Tubular Bells on one side my dad's side and on the other side my mother's she would be listening to ABBA, Bee Gees, Carpenters, great great pop you know Sam Cooke, great soul singers, Marvin Gaye. I grew up with all these things and I never really distinguished between them until I was older you know you, when you get to a teenager you have to start choosing you know which horse to back as it were and I wasn't necessarily ever aware of that kind of snobby sort of side of musical genre and I've never really understood it either. And I've always loved great pop. And it's always been there, you know, whether you whether you choose to see it or not, there has been always been a pop sensibility in all of my records, whether they were more on the progressive side or more on the metal side or whatever they were, there's always been this element of just loving great melodies and, and great pop songs and that kind of euphoria that you can get from, from great pop. You know, unless we forget, the Beatles are the quintessential pop artist, you know, pop band. You know. I think some people have this idea that pop is this, you know, very negative thing. The Beatles are the ultimate pop band. Uh, a band that focused on the art of the three-minute song, but did it in a way that had such incredible sophistication and depth that it could engage you on many different levels. And I think this is something, you asked your question, I think this is something that I didn't feel necessarily was missing from my back catalogue, but I felt it was missing from everyone's back catalogue. What I mean by that is I don't know there's I don't know there's many records these days which kind of inhabit that world between underground music and pop music. So, for example, on the one hand at the moment we have the real extreme pop music, which is very banal, very anodyne, very bland. And then at the, on the other hand we have a lot of experimental underground bands doing really interesting things. But what we don't have is the kind of artists I grew up with, like Kate Bush, Tears for Fears, Peter Gabriel, The Police, Talking Heads, Talk Talk. These were artists who made mainstream pop music, but did it in an incredibly sophisticated way. I don't see many people make, I don't hear many people making those kind of records anymore. And I miss that. And I wanted to, and I grew up with all that music, so I wanted to maybe try and, and reclaim, if you like, that side of my music personality, but without compromising on any of the ambition in terms of the production, the arrangement, the lyrical subject matter is still quite intense. So, to me, the trick is being able to, to be more accessible, but without losing anything of what people associate with, with my musical sound. And I hope that that's what I achieve with this record. The words, words like rock music didn't really exist until, you know, maybe the late 60s, early 70s. Until that, what the Beatles did was pop. What the Beach Boys did was pop. What the Doors did was pop. It's pop music. And... I think there is, you know, obviously there's a connotation. A lot of people think pop is the very, the very kind of shallow, um, uh, cheesy aspect of, you know, of music. And unfortunately, that's because I think there has been so little of the kind of music I'm talking about. Like a band like Tears for Fears, for example, they're pure. It's pure pop, but it's also just as ambitious and just as epic as any rock music ever made. You know, I think. And the Beatles, obviously, again, being the, the, the quintessential example of a pop band. Um, so I think people sometimes forget that. They just think, you think, you say pop and they think One Direction or, you know, or... Um, 
I don't even know the names of these artists, oh, you know, Ed, find them. <laughs> Ed Sheeran, you know, all these, these kind of people. My main motivation every time with every record is actually um, a negative one, which is I don't want to do that again. What I mean by that is that every record I make is almost like a reaction to what's gone before. And you're absolutely right when you say in some ways it is a continuation of Hank and I Rose, because it is. But there are also very distinct differences. This, the emphasis on more conventional song structures. Um, l much less emphasis on um, the, mu the muso aspect. For example, I play a lot of the guitar on this record, so there's nothing fast or clever because I can't do that. But I didn't want that. I wanted something more simple, more natural, more organic, something that actually felt like an extension of the song, the vocals in a way. Um, so there's not so much of the clever musicianship on this record. There's also obviously a lot more... Um, awareness of what's going on in the world right now. This album is in, in many respects, it is a companion to Hand Cannot Raise, because Hand Cannot Raise was about a particular story of a particular individual and the way that modern life and social media can isolate people in a very negative way. And this album is a little bit broader than that. It talks about refugees, it talks about terrorists, it talks about religious fundamentalists, it talks about the nature of truth and the way that truth, apparently in the last couple of years, has become a very, um, something that can be twisted and, and perverted to serve whatever purpose you need, whatever agenda you need, need to serve. And these are all very current topical things, but all of, almost all of the, the way I deal with almost all of these subjects is to create a story about a particular individual. So there's no... I hope there's no political sloganeering, there's no preaching to the audience. It's more like, here's a story about a particular refugee in a camp, here's a story about a particular you know, religious fundamentalist, and so it's still, in a way, the stories still feel more like they're finding, they're finding the great in the small, if you know what I mean. But it's a big, epic-sounding record. Paul was a member of Oasis, he's been he's, he's made all Noel Gallagher's albums, he was also in the Black Crows, I mean he's a very, he played with Tom Jones, he's a very, very experienced um, musician, he's also a great guitar player, who has done a lot of very diverse things. And it's interesting, when I worked with Alan, my goal was, the reason I worked with Alan is because I really wanted the record to sound like a kind of golden era 70s, classic 70s, I wanted to have that sort of sound to it. And on this record, I wanted to go in the opposite direction. I wanted it to sound very much um, like a modern record. And But I still wanted someone that would push me. And the answer to your question, how do you do all these things? Well, um, I can do them all, but the problem is if I do them all, I don't necessarily push myself in the way that I would like. Now, every, let me explain what I mean by that. Everyone has their cliches. The things that they fall back on time and time again. If I pick up a guitar and I start writing a song, before I know it I'm playing the same chords, I'm writing about the same kind of subject matter, I'm falling back on my own kind of cliches. Every, you know, some people, you, you could say it's a good thing because that's what gives you a personality, a musical personality, is your kind of cliches are become your musical personality. But at the same time, you can really bore yourself very easily if you feel like, oh, I've kind of written that before, you know, oh, I've done that before, you know. And a lot of what I write now, because I've been making records for so long, a lot of what I write, I can easily dismiss it as something I've already done. But the one thing I can do to make sure that doesn't happen is to bring in other people, to bounce ideas off, to collaborate. And that was definitely the way it's worked on this album with, with Paul. He pushed me. He's really opinionated. And he's very, he can be very brutally honest. 
And, but I needed that because I wanted someone that would kind of push me out of my comfort zone, make me think about... I'll tell you what he really did. He made me think about being a singer. There's one thing to be the songwriter that sings the songs, but it's another thing to be the singer, if you see what I mean. Um, in the past, I think when I've sang my song, when I've been singing my songs, I've been singing them almost like... Well, I'm the songwriter, so I have to be the guy that sings it. Almost like a... I've got no choice but to sing this song. But he made me think, actually, about performing and being a singer. Forget that you wrote the song. How would you, as a singer, how would you interpret this song? How would you relate to the lyrics? And like the songs on the record with Ninette, the, the female singer, we actually sang them together. We actually were sit, uh, sitting across, you know, microphone there, microphone here, we were singing to each other. That was scary for me. Because I'm not the sort of person who has the confidence. She's an amazing singer, I'm not. But he kind of gave me the confidence to say, but you, you have something special about the way you sing. You do, have a, you do have a distinctive quality as a singer. And he really pushed me to try to be a singer and to be confident in singing and performing and getting inside the characters and the songs. And I don't think that's something that anyone's ever done with me before, probably because I wouldn't let them. But I really, I wanted to be pushed and I really let him do that with me. And I hope that that comes across in the songs. I really worked so hard on the, on the vocals on the album. Well, the simple answer to the first part of your question is she's amazing. <laughs> you know, uh, what made me make that decision? She's amazing. And she sang, uh, you probably know she sang Routine on the last album. And actually that was the first time I'd worked with her. And it was right at the end of the, it was right at the end of the recording process. And I didn't, I'd kind of written the song, I'd recorded it with my voice. And I knew that I wanted a female singer, but I didn't know who. And I, I actually had about three or four different singers have a go at it. And in the end, her version was, was by far the one that I, that I felt was the best. And then later on, she came out on tour with me, and, and, and we did some shows, and, and she did a couple more songs with me on, on the sort of EP thing that I put out last year, four and a half. And, but I had never actually conceived an album project from the beginning with her in mind until this album. So this is the first time that I actually sat down and wrote songs knowing that she would be the one that would sing them. So it's almost like, you know, when, when a movie director writes a script and they, they already know who the director's, who the actor's going to be. And it changes the way you write the part. If you're, if you're a screenwriter and you know that Johnny Depp is going to be playing this character or, or you know, or, or whoever, you kind of write knowing their character. And I think it was the same with me, because I knew Ninette was going to be doing this, this album with me, I was able to actually write the songs with her in mind, and with this duet idea in mind. And again, that's not something I've ever done before. I've never written for another singer before in my life. Because again, it's hard. It's hard to put your words into someone else's mouth. But when she sings my words, it's amazing. It's amazing. She she brings the, you know she brings the songs to life you know as a great singer should. So it's in a way an obvious choice that uh, Tarea was the uh, the choice the, cho the chosen song to be uh, the one to promote the album. Well, Pariah was the first choice because I t honestly it was the first choice because I didn't want to scare my audience. That's the honest truth because actually Pariah I think I I kind of knew that was a song that my fan base would like. And it wasn't a controversial kind of choice. If I'd picked something like Permanating, for example, which is the very ABBA influenced song, and released that as the first song off the record, I think it could have sent out a very wrong signal. And this is a very diverse record, you know, you've heard the record, it's very diverse. I think Pariah was a safe choice. Okay, firstly, Ninette is incredible on it, uh, but secondly, it's not something. I think that's going to shock people about he's gone in, you know, Stephen Wilson's gone in a completely different direction. It's so for me, it, it worked as a nice sort of bridge 
gentle, you know, kind of move into this new album. In many ways, it's it feels like, like I mentioned to you before, it feels like um, I've allowed myself to be more of a performer on this record. Um, in contrast to perhaps previous records where I was the songwriter and the producer, here most of the guitar is me, most of the bass is me, a lot of the keyboards are me, the singing, like the guitar solos mostly are me, a lot of the singing I've, I've allowed myself to try different things, singing falsetto for the first time in, in some of the songs. Um, I've allowed myself to express perhaps more of the happier side of my music, of my personality. It's, people think oh, I'm miserable because most of my music is quite melancholic, but for the first time on this record, I think there are moments of joy, you know, and happiness and a positive sort of, uh, you know, message as well. Um, lyrically, I guess some of the emotions and some of the sentiment in the lyrics are more personal. I'm still writing from the perspective of characters, but it seems to me, every album I make, it seems to me I put more of myself into these characters. You know, like on the last album, Hand Cannot Erase, that character was a lot of it, a lot of her was me, you know, a lot of my concerns, a lot of my uh, fears and, and uh, ideas I kind of put into this character. And it's definitely the same same on this record too. It's hard, I think it's hard not to, not to take some of the stuff that's going on in the world right now, it's hard not to take it in a very personal way. Because it's so, it, it's, some of it is so offensive, you know, um, to me anyway, you know, when someone like Donald Trump stands up and says things that are so obnoxious and so prejudicial and I take it very, I take it personally. I think a lot of people do. They t we, we tend to take these things actually quite personal, don't we? But he's very clever because he uses that. He uses that kind of very emotional response that people have to what he says in a very positive, you know, to him he uses it in a kind of positive way. Um, so I think we're all feeling a little bit, and obviously things like the terrorist attacks, you, they, they seem almost somehow like a, a personal attack sometimes. But I'm, I'm feeling like I want to be more brutal and more direct about the way I, I deal with these things in the songs. Whereas when I was working on my record, I'm the auteur, I'm the, the, the writer, the director, the, it's a very personal process. When I came to his record, I could be more like um, the helper, the collaborator, the, the producer, the, the, the voice of, you know, suggestion. Can we, maybe we should try this, maybe we should try that. But he kind of done the hard work. The hard work is writing. Completely. I mean, I, you know, writing music for me, filling the blank page, is the hardest thing of all. Recording is easy. Recording is fun. It's just like you've got all the paints mixed up. You just splash them on the canvas now, and you just. Try. But actually, getting those raw ingredients, getting the the lyrics and the songs and the melodies, is so hard. It's so hard to do something that hasn't doesn't sound like it hasn't been done a million times by you or by anyone. Um, so in his case, in, in the case of Blackfield, he'd done all that, he'd written the song, so that was fun. That was really fun. I've no idea. <laughs> I mean, I'd love to give you a sort of intellectual answer. I mean, the song itself, uh, came very easily. I mean, I, I was just talking a minute ago about how songwriting is really hard. That's one, that was a song that was an exception. And, and um, it came very easily, very quickly. And immediately, I said to myself, I can't put that on my album. I put it aside. I can't put that on my album. It's way too pop and happy. I can't.
and I carried on writing all the other stuff. But I would be playing it to people. I play it, you know, I played to Paul, the producer, and I play it, play it to my partner, and I play it to my friends. Everyone loved it, and everyone said to me, "It sounds like you." I said, "I said, I said, I can't put this, I can't put this record on the air. I can't put this track on the air because it doesn't sound anything like me." So yes, it sounds absolutely like you. Yes, I can hear it's different, but it sounds like you. And it kind of gave me the confidence in a way. Oh, well, maybe, maybe I can put this on the record. You know, it, I've never had anything like this on, my, on one of my records before. It's kind of happy, it's full of joy, um, but maybe it is me, it is me, you know, it sounds like me. And I think actually what I really like about it is it does seem to fit on the record, it doesn't seem like it's, it doesn't seem like it's on the wrong record. And I think that was my fear, that that couldn't possibly fit in with things like people who eat darkness and to the bone and, but it does to me, somehow it really works, at least to me it seems to work really well. Um, recording wise I mean the reference points were um, ABBA Mr. Blue Sky a um, bit of Daft Punk it was a bit of a mixture of you know of things you know electronic music and 70s pop and 80s pop and um, and I'm singing falsetto as well which is quite different for me uh, I'm not necessarily aware of having a particular approach to recording it, except that it, it was, when I demoed it, it was kind of already complete, we just made it sound a bit better. Yeah, I've already got my, I already know what the set's going to be. <laughs> um, I think it's going to work great. You know, one thing I actually uh, in the past have been slightly frustrated by is I, I didn't have enough, felt, felt like sometimes the, the, the show wasn't quite balanced because there wasn't enough um, more of, of more immediate, shorter songs. And now I have an album that has several on, so I think actually it's going to be a little bit more balanced. There's still going to be long songs, epic songs, you know, that's part of what I do too. But there, I mean, there are still epic long songs on this record too, you know, Detonation's like 10 minutes long, it's something nine. Anyway. Um, but I think um, visually everything is going to be, what will help a lot will, to draw everything together will be to get the visual element right. And I have a lot of new films now being made for the songs, like for, the, for the live show. Um, what I want to take the production level up another level, really make something really immersive and spectacular. And it will feel like a musical journey. It will feel like which I'm t taking you on a journey. That's important to me, that everything feels like it has a natural flow and logical kind of unfolding quality to it. So it'll still feel like you're, you're yeah, 